Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. These famous words decorate the gates of hell in Dante's Inferno. They also decorated the doorway to my high school English class back in the late 1980s and early 1990s when I was a high school student. While the sinners trapped in the inferno may have abandoned hope, and some seniors in high school might have abandoned hope too, I sincerely hope that you do not. And although enjoy is probably not the right word, I do hope you find the inferno a compelling and unique piece of literature. We traveled this week to Tuscany, more specifically to Florence, the hometown of the triumvirate of early Italian Renaissance writers, including our author of the week, Dante Alighieri. Dante, like Rihanna or Pink, is most widely known by his first name. He was born in Florence in 1265 and died in exile from his beloved Florence in Ravenna, Italy in 1321. He wrote the Divine Comedy, a series of three great works, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, although Inferno is the most widely read and discussed. Let's take a look at the context of the Inferno's writing and the author that created it. A small note about terminology. The term Renaissance has historically been used to describe the time period between around 1300 and 1700, depending on where in Europe one happens to be. The Renaissance began first in Italy and then spread northward, reaching countries like England in the late 15th century. Recently, the term has come under some scrutiny because of what it implies, that there was a long dark period of history where learning was lost, learning that had to be reborn, the meaning of the word Renaissance in French, in Italy in the 14th century. You will hear many scholars, including me, sometimes refer to this time period as early modern instead of Renaissance. While the term early modern is more often used to describe literature and history, Renaissance is still the go-to term when speaking about art. I will be using these terms, Renaissance and early modern, interchangeably when I talk about this time period. Today we know Florence for its many great works of art, like Michelangelo's David, and for being the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance. But even before the Renaissance was underway, many scholars mark as beginning in the 14th century, Florence was full of beautiful artwork, including this mosaic from the baptistry of San Giovanni Church. Dante knew of this mosaic, and it almost certainly influenced his depiction of Satan in the Inferno, as having three heads, and each of them chewing on a different sinner. In the latter half of the 13th century, two warring political factions in Florence, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, struggled for prominence with each side holding power at some point. The whole genesis of the conflict began with warring factions in the Holy Roman Empire, and the names Guelph and Ghibelline are actually German in or origin. The whole conflict is confusing and convoluted. If you're interested in the details of Florentine politics, I've linked two websites in the resources section of the lecture notes. There's a brief synopsis, synopsis in the TED-Ed video I've assigned for this week also. Dante belonged to a faction of the Guelph party and was in a position of power in Florence in the early 1300s. The conflict is much discussed in the Inferno, with various prominent political players making an appearance in hell. Dante was exiled from Florence in January 1302 after being accused, probably falsely, of extortion. Dante sets the Inferno in 1300, but he wrote the Divine Comedy several years later, composing it between 1308 and 1321. So, when we see characters prophesied about Dante the character's future in the poem, Dante the poet would have been speaking from a position of authority. Dante, along with Petrarch and Boccaccio, forms the three crowns of Italian literature. All three of these authors lived in Florence during the 14th century. Dante is the oldest of the writers, and Petrarch and Boccaccio were peers. Both later writers promoted Dante's work, which was pretty much an instant hit. Boccaccio, whom I mentioned last week as the writer of another famous frame story, The Decameron, wrote the first biography of Dante and actually was paid to go around Florence giving lectures on the meaning of Dante's works. Petrarch was a very influential poet, popularizing the sonnet form. We'll talk about him more in World Lit too at the beginning of the semester. All three of the crowns wrote in the vernacular, the everyday language of normal people, 
in a Tuscan dialect of Italian, just as Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales in a vernacular dialect, in his case the East Midlands dialect of Middle English. A small side note is in order here. Chaucer traveled to Italy extensively for his job as a government official in the 14th century, and may have come into contact with either Petrarch or Boccaccio, or both. As influential as these two later writers were, they venerated Dante and his divine comedy. As I stated earlier, Dante Alighieri was born in Florence in 1265. I won't go into his life story much here, as I've assigned background reading from the Norton Anthology. Dante had a childhood crush, Beatrice Portinaro, whom he met when he was nine and she was eight, around 1274, and whom he would continue to idealize even after her death in 1290. Beatrice, though she does not appear in person in the Inferno directly, definitely haunts Dante the narrator's thoughts. When Virgil, his guide through hell and purgatory, cannot follow Dante the character into heaven, it is Beatrice who takes over the job. The Inferno is one part of a three-part epic poem called the Divine Comedy. This is a comedy in the old sense of the word, which means basically that order is restored in the end. I would like to talk about some of its literary features here before I send you forth to read the work on your own. The Divine Comedy is written in something called Terza Rima, a format invented by Dante for this poem. I want to give you the first line of the Inferno to illustrate the scheme of syllables for the Divine Comedy in Terza Rima. Nel mezzo di cammin di nostra vita, which means in the middle of our journey of life. You see here an example of a first line of Terza Rima which involves three lines per syllable and 33 lines per stanza. Each line has 11 syllables, and this is called hindecasyllabic. That's a really long word. The numbers involved here are highly theological, with three lines per stanza representing the Trinity and the 33 syllables per stanza representing the years of Jesus's life on earth. The rhyme scheme is an interlocking one, ABA, BCB, CDC. Poets throughout the centuries have used terza rima, including Chaucer, who introduced this form to England. Your translator for this work in the anthology, John Chiardi, chose not to imitate terza rima in his English translation, because he said it would be a disaster. This illustrates the challenges of translating poetry from one language to another. Let's talk about the Inferno as an epic now. First of all, it's important to understand that Dante's Divine Comedy is a literary epic. Literary epics have a specific real person author, like the Aeneid by Virgil, who happens to be Dante's guide, or Paradise Lost by John Milton. However, even though literary epics are the work of a particular person at a particular time, they have much in common with folk epics like the Iliad and the Ramayana. Some epic features that we find in the Divine Comedy that also occur in folk epics include an invocation of a muse, a journey, including a visit to the underworld, and supernatural elements. One might also detect some national significance, at least in Dante's mind, hence all the references to the Florentine politics of the late 13th and early 14th centuries. If you're rusty on your epic features, I recommend re-watching the Features of Epics video. You can find it linked in week two for Gilgamesh and also in week eight for Beowulf. While you're thinking about the similarities between the Inferno and other epics from this semester, also think about how Dante the character is different from those other epic heroes. Although Dante the poet has fought in a battle, his protagonist boasts no such history. This literary Dante is merely a writer, and a rather wimpy one at that. Note the number of times he faints away, either from fear or from overactive compassion. In addition to its epic subject matter and structure, the Inferno combines several other genres of writing in a hodgepodge of styles popular during the Middle Ages. We have as the main character the persona or pilgrim Dante, 
who has fallen into error and doubt, and whose purpose is to take hold of his faith again. This pattern of falling away in repentance is seen in the spiritual autobiography genre. Two popular examples of this genre widely read in Dante's times were Augustine's Confessions and Boethius's The Consolation of Philosophy. Another closely related genre was that of the medieval vision narrative. Some influential examples of this type of literature were St. Patrick's Purgatory and the Apocalypse of St. Paul. A later example of a vision narrative would be Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love. The final genre present in the Inferno is the allegory, a genre that deserves a section of commentary all on its own. According to Deborah Schwartz, allegory is a form of extended metaphor in which objects and persons within a narrative are equated with meanings that lie outside the narrative itself. The allegorical figure exists simultaneously on two levels of meaning, the literal one, what the figures do in the narrative, and the symbolic level, what the figure stands for outside the narrative. Thus, allegory evokes a dual interest in the events, characters, and setting presented and in the ideas they represent or the significance they bear. In medieval allegory, a character or object or location in the story could stand in from some other person or event or even frame of mind. For instance, in The Romance of a Rose, a work roughly contemporaneous with the Inferno, a young man is attending a garden party, the surface level story, but he is also looking for true love. Sometimes what is being represented is an abstract quality like gluttony or faith. We've also seen allegories before in the parables and fables found in the Christian Bible and the Quran. It's a very old literary technique, but one with which the medieval and Renaissance mind was quite enamored. When Dante's patron, Con Grande, asked him to explain the Inferno, Dante wrote back to him, explaining that it could be understood on four levels, literal, allegorical, typological, and anagogical. The literal story is Dante the character visiting hell, guided by Virgil and meeting various people and observing their punishments. The allegorical level in Dante's description to Con Grande equates to a moral reading. In other words, what lesson about life and behavior can the reader draw from this work? Did Dante the writer want his readers to consider the costs of gluttony and pass up on that second helping of tiramisu in order to avoid the punishments in hell, like rotting away in a pit of sewage while Cerberus claws at you? The typological reading looks for characters and events as types or archetypes of older truths. Dante himself tells the reader to stop and consider the typology of his work in Canto 9, lines 61 through 63, where he addresses the reader thus. O oh, you who have sound intellects, look at the doctrines which hide itself beneath the veil of the strange verses. In other words, the poet is inviting us, through his persona Dante, to interpret the meaning behind the surface-level actions of the devils and tormented souls, and Dante and Virgil too. The time frame of the narrative invites us to make the grandest of comparisons. Dante the character as a type of Christ. Dante enters the inferno on Good Friday, the day of Christ's crucifixion and death and emerges into the world again on Easter Sunday, resurrected from his visit to the afterlife. Think about the typological implications of the narrative as you read Cantos 1 through 17. The fourth way Dante told Con Grande to read the Divine Comedy was anagogically. To read something anagogically is to look towards the spiritual truth. It's another type of allegorical reading, but instead of focusing on human morality in the events and characters in the Inferno, the anagogical reading looks at what the epic poem tells us about God and spirituality. By the way, Dante's advice on reading to Con Grande tracks closely with the methods of medieval theologians, who read Holy Scriptures in the same four-part way, literally or historically, allegorically, typologically, and anagogically. Let's turn now to a brief mention of some of the themes and features of the Inferno. As the Divine Comedy describes Dante the characters travels through the different sections of the afterlife, of course there is a strong interest in justice. Note how rigidly just Dante the, poem, the poet is in his conception of hell. Hell isn't just a place where mean people go. It's a place where anyone who died outside of Christ's grace ends up.
So we meet many pitiable characters like Francesca and Paola in the first circles, as well as some of Dante's heroes, and even one of his former teachers in some of the deeper circles of hell. Speaking of Francesca and Paola, did you notice how these lovers are punished in the first circle of hell, but yet they claim no responsibility for their moral failure? Instead, they blame a book about the affair between Lancelot and Guinevere for leading them astray. Is Dante critiquing reading here in general, or is he judging the courtly love tradition that was still popular at the time of the Inferno's writing? Courtly love was a concept rampant in the Middle Ages that glorified an unequal love relationship between a man and a married woman, who was usually of a higher social station. Dante may have been critiquing the wildly popular stories of courtly love of his time period. Or he might also be preaching to himself for his continued love of his childhood sweetheart, Beatrice, even though she is dead and he is married to someone else. One thing you may notice almost immediately is the highly syncretic nature of this poem. The word syncretic comes from syncretism, a word that means the blending of multiple religions or cultural value systems. The syncretism occurring in the Inferno is a sort very common in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the blending of classical mythology with Christianity. Thus, in the Inferno, we see not only angels and demons from Christian tradition, but also mythological creatures like a minotaur, some centaurs, or charon. In fact, the geography of hell is highly influenced by Greco-Roman conceptions of hell. And Jupiter, or Zeus, and God seem to either coexist or represent the same deity. Look for this part as you read. To say that Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy had an influence on Western civilization would be an understatement. Almost from the moment of its publication, artists have been interested in interpreting characters and scenes from the work, especially from the Inferno. I have just a sampling here to share with you. The Italian Renaissance painter Botticelli, famous for The Birth of Venus and Primavera, contributed 92 original illustrations for a 1481 manuscript edition of the Divine Comedy. Sculptor Pierre Rodin's piece, The Gates of Hell, pictured here, draws heavily from the Inferno for his imagery, and Rodin's The Kiss, pictured on a previous screen, is based on the story of Paola and Francesca. The book in the sculpture is that salacious tale of Lancelot and Guinevere, mentioned by Dante. There may have been several, or there have been several film adaptations of Dante's work, especially in silent films, but many more films make reference to the Inferno, including the 1995 thriller Seven, The Bucket List, and even Ghostbusters 2. TV shows have also drawn from Dante as well, including WrestleMania 36, if you can believe it. Musicians likewise have been inspired by Dante, both classical and popular musicians. Neil Gaiman's comic book series, The Sandman, contains many Dante references, and there is even a video game, Dante's Inferno, from 2010. These are just a few of the many Inferno adaptations and references in our culture today. This work has and will continue to capture our imagination, whether we agree with Dante's conception of the afterlife or not.